questions. All right. Um, good evening. Well, thank you for the invitation to to come and speak about um, about Titan and uh, Dragonfly. Um, uh, it's a very exciting mission that is uh, currently in its formulation uh, phase, and uh, I expect uh, we will be starting our very long journey to Titan from uh, from Florida. Um, first, um, just a, a note about uh, APL, where I work, um, you know, up the coast in in uh, Maryland. Um, APL has a you know, long history of building spacecraft. Um, it uh, developed the the transit uh, navigation satellites that were sort of the predecessor of, of GPS. Uh, we have got into the planetary business with the first uh, discovery mission uh, near the near Earth asteroid rendezvous back in the early 90s. Uh, we built Messenger, uh, which it was uh, orbiting the, the, the hottest planet, uh, and, and in fact, Parker Solar Probe, uh, even closer to the sun than that. And of course, New Horizons uh, visited uh, Pluto and Arrakoth and is on its way into the, the outer, outer reaches of space. Um, so there's a lot, lot going on here. Um, and um, I'll, uh, I'll tell you about, uh, about Dragonfly. Um, my own uh, trajectory, uh, I often like to, to share um, just for the benefit of uh, you know, early career folks who you know, wonder how, to, how, how these uh, sort of opportunities emerge. Um, I uh, started out as, a, as an engineer. Um, uh, my formative years were in the, in the UK. Um, and I was very fortunate that my first job straight out of college was for the European Space Agency, uh, working on um, the very beginning of the, uh, the Huygens uh, project, the, the Titan probe that was part of the uh, NASA ESA uh, RZ uh, Cassini mission. Um, and in fact, I joined the, the project there um, at roughly the same stage that uh, Dragonfly is is in right now, the early part of, uh, of Phase B. Um, I uh, went um, from from the Netherlands, uh, from from ESA to back to the UK. Uh, I sort of saw that I I kind of was maybe a bit more of a scientist than an engineer, and um, I, I really enjoyed the. Um, thinking about how systems and instruments interact with, with planetary environments. And so I, I got to work um, building um, one of the experiments on the Huygens probe. Um, after I got my PhD, uh, I came to the US, uh, to Arizona, to work on the first um, Hubble uh, Space Telescope maps of Titan and got involved in uh, planning Cassini's radar observations. Um, and, and partly uh, because of that, I kind of picked up a bit of planetary geology. I, I sometimes appear on um, TV shows uh, talking about Titan sand dunes or, or other landforms, uh, but I don't actually have any, any formal training in geology. Um, we uh, also, as Cassini was on its way, um, uh, started thinking about what we might do at Titan uh, afterwards. Um, and in 2006, I came here to APL and as is the the typical um, situation in, in this business. I was involved in many proposals that, that went nowhere, um, but I have been lucky to be involved in a number of um, flight missions, the uh, Akatsuki uh, mission of Japanese uh, climate orbiter at Venus, uh, the InSight Mars lander, and in fact, I have a small role um, in the Perseverance uh, Mars rover uh, about to uh, about to land on Mars. Um, just um, uh, while I see uh, something flashing on the edge of the screen, because I um, can't really uh, concentrate on the chat as well as uh, talking, um, the hope is to defer uh, questions to, to the end. We'll be able to come back to slides if we need to, to refer to them, but uh, I'm sure questions will come up. So um, put them in the, in the chat or uh, the Q&A rather, um, or uh, there'll be an opportunity to, to ask them at the end. Um, a, a human lifetime is, is sort of an, has an interesting relationship to the year on Titan, um, and Titan's year and seasons are, are an important part of this story. Uh, Saturn and Titan take about um, 30 Earth years to go around the sun, um, and so you know a season on Titan is seven years, um, and so a human being basically gets to go around the block uh, two and a bit times. Um, and uh, obviously the astrodynamics are such that um, something launched from Earth um, takes you know, a quarter 
of a Titan year to get out to, to Saturn. So, you know, it's, this is not an enterprise for those uh, seeking instant gratification. Um, one important point to note um, about uh, Saturn's orbit around the sun is it's somewhat eccentric. Um, the perihelion is an astronomical unit closer uh, to the sun than is aphelion. Um, and the arrangement of Titan's poles, Titan is, has an, a tilted equator, uh, much like the Earth, is such that uh, the south pole is kind of pointed towards the sun during southern summer. So southern summer you know, happens to be near perihelion. So southern summer is shorter, um, but warmer than, than the northern hemisphere. So the, the seasonal cycle isn't quite symmetric. And, and that turns out to affect um, how liquids are distributed on the surface of Titan. Titan not only has a, a dense atmosphere, but uh, also has uh, surface liquids. Um, it's fun to um, put on, uh, you know, life milestones on on a Titan clock. You know, you can put your, you know, wedding days and and things like that on on here. Um, I can now populate a good part of the Titan year with uh, with books. I've written some of these, maybe of interest to to you. I did a book on the dynamics of um, of, of spinning things like frisbees and boomerangs. Um, there's a book on space systems failures. Uh, several books on on Titan, including uh, this one, the uh, Owner's Workshop Manual, which has all the uh, all the, the best mosaics and uh, results from from Cassini. Um, but it, it's interesting, sort of looking back, that all of these different dimensions all sort of um, converge in in what we're trying to do with with Dragonfly um, when you are um, thinking of exploring an area that that has. Uh, has dunes, or you're interested in in how uh, rotor downwash may may kick up dirt. Um, you know the the work I've done um, exploring uh, sand dunes on on Earth and and, and Mars and Titan um, comes into play, uh, and that that to me is the the sort of most stimulating um, aspect of, of the work I do. That it it can be very multidisciplinary. Um, early on in the Dragonfly project, um, I, I served the role of, of project scientist, but because I have this sort of engineering background uh, and, and for some other reasons, we, um, we sort of made up the term mission architect uh, uh, for, uh, for what I do. Uh, you know, it really is about understanding and anticipating how the, the vehicle and the instruments are going to operate um, in the environment um, on Titan and, and on their, its way there. Um, going back to um, to uh, Huygens, um, I uh, uh, you know, was involved very very early on, and then the development of, of one of the instruments. One of the fun things about the way the European Space Agency um, puts missions together is it it has a sort of formalised uh, pork barrelling that um, uh, contracts are distributed to the member states in the same proportion uh, as uh, ESA receives a, a budget. Um, so, you know, if you're a project manager and you just you know, want to get the thing done, right, just have the Germans build the whole thing and it'll be great. Um, but what a project manager in ESA has to do is give 20% to Germany and 25% to France and, uh, you know, 3% for Belgium and find something for the Finns to do. Um, so it's a real sort of uh, political and uh, industrial contractual jigsaw. And I like to point out that, you know, one of the reasons that um, space missions are, are challenging and expensive is, is you have to anticipate how to bring all this stuff together. Um, you know, not only is there a, a heat shield here um, built with uh, French ballistic missile um, thermal protection technology, but, um, you know, that is attaching to a back cover structure that was made in Spain. Um, this, you need a dolly to hold the things in place while you line the bolts up. And, you know, lining up these bolts has to be done on, on paper. This was um, early 90s before uh, PDF documents, before, um, you know, uh, box or other um, uh, document sharing websites. You know, we, we faxed big documents around and, and mailed them. And those described the, the signal levels on the voltage, uh, you know, on the, the pins. Um, where the bolts go and so on. And then somebody had to figure out that to, to make these things together, you need this dolly 
uh, which comes from uh, Austria as it happens, and that has to fit through this door in this uh, test facility in Germany. So there are you know, a, lot of, a lot of interesting things coming from different places to, to make Huygens happen. Um, but it was uh, a very bold uh, endeavor. It was a completely new thing for, for ESA. It had never done a planetary mission uh, before. Uh, it would have been a bold thing for, for NASA to do by, by itself, come to that. Um, but uh, it was a, a great adventure to be, be part of it um, from, the, from the early stages. And uh, you know, then we, we had to wait. You know, it took uh, seven years from, um, from Florida to, to the Saturnian system. Um, Cassini arrived um, in uh, July of uh, 2004 uh, and delivered the, the Huygens probe um, actually Christmas Eve. Um, and uh, the probe sailed through space by itself for three weeks before hitting the Titan atmosphere at six kilometers a second and parachuting down to the surface. Uh, there was no actual guarantee that the probe would survive impact because we had no idea what we were going to, to land in. Um, it was a, a bonus, in fact, that the, uh, the probe survived quite happily. Um, my own uh, little 14 grams of the, the 200 kilogram Huygens probe is, um, is this thing. It's a, an instrument called a penetrometer. It's a little uh, force transducer that um, stuck out of the, the bottom of the probe. Uh, it has a little piezoelectric element that generates a, a charge when it's squeezed. And so when the probe came in to, to, to land, to impact, um, this uh, instrument was driven into the ground and the force history um, tells you a little bit about the material that uh, that we, we would land in. Um, so the thing is sampled at 10,000 samples a second. Uh, there were 500 readings, so, you know, one twentieth of a second, it's all over. Um, this is a force axis. Um, and, you know, dry sand, um, you, you're familiar with, uh, you know, the sand at the beach. The, when you squeeze it, the grains sort of lock up together. And so you get this sort of steeply uh, increasing force signature, uh, wet clay, deforms like a plastic solid or a very viscous liquid, it's more or less constant. And, and gravel gives you spikes and the, the spacing and the height of the spikes tells you about the particle size. So, you know, very, very simple, almost low tech sort of instrument. Uh, and uh, when people can travel again, you can go and see this in the, uh, uh, the spare at least, um, in the, the London Science Museum. Um, and, and like all good scientific stories, you know, what we actually got at Titan was um, you know, nothing like um, the, the tests I did in the lab as a, as a grad student. Um, this is at the European Space Operations Center in, in Darmstadt, Germany, um, uh, on, in January of 2005. And uh, there is the data from Titan from this little instrument. Um, you know, first surprise was, you know, wow, the thing actually worked. Um, after seven years waiting for this, you know, 20, uh, 1 20th of a second of data. Um, and you'd think, actually, um, having you know spent seven years waiting and you know, three or four years in development, that you'd get um, you know a few weeks to carefully consider the data and uh, develop a, uh, a you know, scientific interpretation. But but no, the, the data came down at 6 p.m. Um, there were 80 of us scientists at, at, at ESOC and about 150 journalists camped outside. Um, and so we got the data at, at about 6 p.m. And press conference at eleven, go. Um, so you know we all had our assigned tasks. You know mine was to look at the little squiggly line and make sense of it. And um, you know well what happened here? Well, all right, this bump is just the back end hitting doesn't really mean much. Otherwise it's kind of flat, little spiky here. Um, and there's this big spike at the beginning. You know what what was that all about? Was there a spark jump from the the surface or you know what happened? Um, and uh, we just sort of, you know, speculated, well, it looks, you know, in terms of hardness, looks like packed snow, kind of clay, maybe wet sand, something like that. And, well, I don't know about the spike, maybe there was like a crust on top and, you know, sort of said, you know, creme brulee. And uh, hesitantly, my, uh, my former advisor, the principal investigator of the uh, uh, surface experiment, you know, offered that up at the the press conference and and you know the media love that right the the public likes um, uh, food analogies um, Titan team gets just desserts from creme brulee surface was the the headline in Nature um, 
we hadn't, uh, when we were developing these interpretations, seen the pictures. There was another team in another building uh, working on those. But uh, in fact, you know, we had no right to get this, this to expect this picture. Um, the probe could have failed. The parachute could have fallen on top of the camera. Um, but in fact, we got this this view showing these these rounded cobbles. Um, and the way you get rounded cobbles is by tumbling them in a in a stream in a flash flood. Um, and that that told us instantly that that you know Titan has been shaped by by similar processes to those we we have on Earth. There's a a methane cycle uh, on Titan, just as a, as there is a, a hydrological cycle with water um, on, on Earth. Um, let me uh, not to dwell too much on the past. I know everyone wants to hear about Dragonfly. So, um, as as the Huygens probe came down, um, it uh, took images, um, giving us you know very much a sort of airplane window view. This is from about seven kilometers up, so typical airliner altitude. Um, and we see this sort of highland. This is about a hundred meters higher than than the dark material. You can see sort of river networks here, um, and these two. Uh, sort of almost straight streaks up here are actually sand dunes. Uh, we subsequently observed them in Cassini radar images and, and um, generalized to other parts of the planet where the, the dunes are very, very obvious. Um, and, and, you know, you can see um, off in the distance, this is, you know, 20 odd kilometers away. Um, the Titan atmosphere uh, is hazy. Um, and that's why the Voyager mission in, in uh, the 1980s couldn't see the surface. But it's it's uh, opaque because it's very thick. Um, the the haze content per you know unit volume is actually actually quite small. The the visibility in, in terrestrial terms would be many tens of kilometers. Um, so it's important to to understand that. Um, Titan is uh, 100 is 10 times further from the sun than the Earth, so it gets a uh, 100 times less sunlight at the at the top of the atmosphere, and only some of the light filters through the haze. The the blue light is is blocked completely. Um, most of the the light that gets through is in in the red and the near infrared. Um, there are uh, wavelengths uh, at which uh, light is strongly absorbed by by methane in the atmosphere. And you can tell I've got this transatlantic schizophrenia. Sometimes I say methane, sometimes I say methane, uh, tomato, tomato. Um, uh, and it's important to understand this uh, this spectrum when you're designing cameras, for example, right? Your your exposure time uh, has to be long enough to get enough light to get good signal. Um, but on a moving vehicle like a rotorcraft, uh, you have to think about, you know, is the vehicle going to be vibrating? So you don't want uh, too long an exposure time. Um, but you know that that has all been sort of um, demonstrated by by Huygens. Huygens gave us the, the ground truth that, that validates these these light models, um, and in, in fact we'll use some of this absorption um, to measure the methane humidity uh, as part of our uh, efforts to understand uh, Titan's weather. Um, so just to put things in context, right, uh, uh, a thousand times less sunlight, so a hundred times less at the top of the atmosphere, ten percent of that gets down to the ground. Um, that's still uh, a thousand times brighter than full moonlight on the Earth. I mean, you know, you'd be able to see completely fine. You, 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 your eyes, your eyes adapt uh, very easily. Um, we know uh, Titan has uh, surface liquids. In fact, they're they're at, at uh, around the North Pole. Uh, there are several seas um, and uh, and lakes. There's a, a, a one or two lakes in the in the south. Um, there are occasionally clouds. It's it's actually um, uh, very rare that there are convective, you know, cumulonimbus clouds that that have rain on Titan. Um, it does happen, and in fact, uh, Cassini saw um, maybe two occasions where um, not only were there, there clouds, but there were surface changes. Um, in 2009, the equinox season, we actually saw a big cloud system develop, uh, and then areas of the ground that had been bright got dark, and then over the following months they they brightened back to, to where they had been before. And, and the obvious interpretation is that the ground got wet, that makes ground darker, and then it dried out. So Titan has active weather today. I mean, it's seasonally dependent, um, but, um, but it's the only other world in the solar system where we know that um, you know, liquid rains down onto the surface and carves river channels today uh, the same way that it happens on Earth. Except the working fluid here is, is methane at 94 Kelvin and not, not water. So it's a very interesting uh, world to study from the perspective of comparative planetology. 
Um, we know something about the winds on Titan. Um, we actually now have very good models, um, you know, global circulation models that simulate uh, the, the, the dynamics of the atmosphere, um, conditioned by the fact that you know the sun is absorbed by the haze at different altitudes. And Titan rotates uh, slowly uh, compared to the Earth. Uh, Titan goes around Saturn uh, once every 16 Earth days. Um, so, you know, a, a point on the surface of Titan is in darkness for um, uh, for eight Earth days, uh, which which turns out to be important in our operations planning. Um, the, the winds near the surface are about a meter per second. Uh, Titan's atmosphere, which is mostly nitrogen, is about five times denser than ours. So, you know, you get a bit more dynamic pressure, a um, bit, bit more effect for a given wind speed. Um, but the, the winds are are really quite quite gentle, um, big enough on occasion to to sculpt sand dunes um, and probably to form uh, waves on the surface of the seas, um, but but not not typically. Um, anyway, we we can use this understanding to develop the um, the sort of environmental um, specification for uh, for vehicles to to explore uh, Titan and. Maybe I've gone into a bit more more detail on this slide than than I should. We can come back to it if anyone's really interested in in, in turbulence. Um, let me just check that the audio is is still working okay. And I not hearing anyone say so. Okay, okay, great. No worries. Okay, I'll press on. So, um, Cassini was at um, uh, at Saturn and, and Titan for um, thirteen years, from two thousand four till September twenty seventeen. It you know, had a, a first extended mission, and then, uh, in fact, a second extended mission to take it all the way to the um, the uh, northern uh, summer solstice, and um, by making about one hundred and twenty six close flybys of Titan, uh, Cassini was able to, to map much of its surface. Um, this is a, a near infrared uh, image uh, mosaic um, made from actually thousands and thousands of, of images. Um, and you, you, know, you can see there's a, a very sort of diverse landscape. Um, Titan's uh, diameter is 5,000 kilometers. So it's bigger than the planet Mercury, um, rather bigger than our, our moon. Um, and uh, you know you can see there's bright areas and dark areas. Um, this bright leading edge um, uh, feature is called Xanadu. It's actually somewhat mountainous. Uh, you can see a couple of craters, but actually not many craters. The surface is geologically young. Uh, all these sort of wispy dark areas um, uh, at low latitudes are actually sand seas covered in, in dunes. Um, the high latitude dark areas, this sort of sprawling thing is, is Kraken Mare, is a, a sea of liquid methane um, about um, almost a thousand kilometers from, from, from end to end. Um, and uh, there's another lake in the, in the south. Um, but something we really don't know very well and, and knew even in the late 90s before Cassini was, was launched, uh, we really don't know what the stuff is made of. I mean, we know there is um, photochemistry in Titan's atmosphere, wherein methane is broken up by ultraviolet light, and the fragments of methane and nitrogen recombine in all kinds of ways to make um, uh, heavier organics that drizzle down onto the surface. Um, but uh, exactly uh, what the composition is, and, and in particular, uh, how that organic composition may have been further processed uh, on Titan's surface in those places like uh, like impact craters, where there may have been energy delivered by the impact that has melted some of the crust. And we think the crust of most um, outer solar system satellites is, is water ice. So you, when you form a crater, you make melt, you make liquid water, and you basically in, in the laboratory, if you add liquid water to Titan organics or, or simulations thereof, then you um, make um, you can make amino acids, uh, which are the building blocks of proteins. You can make um, uh, pyrimidine bases, which are um, the the letters uh, that encode information in our DNA. So you know you can make a lot of the the building blocks of life, and we've no idea exactly how 
uh, far down the, the, the sort of ladder of complexity or up the ladder of complexity uh, towards the processes that execute the functions of life uh, Titan may have got. But the, the results of this um, amazing chemistry experiment are, are, you know, are littered around on Titan's surface, um, frozen solid waiting for us to pick up. Um, so, uh, you know, this is really driven what we want to do next and, and shaped uh, ideas, um, you know, pre-Cassini and post-Cassini um, to, to really understand just how, um, how biologically relevant the, the chemistry on Titan gets. Um, we want to understand Titan's weather as well, you know, how the methane cycle works, um, uh, the dunes, um, the shape of dunes and the size of dunes actually records the past climate. Uh, we think Titan has climate cycles a little bit like the kroll milankovic cycles that drive our, our glacial periods. Um, but on Titan, what happens is they, they actually push the liquid uh, from the, the northern hemisphere and distill it over to the south and, and back again on, on 50,000 year timescales, we think. Um, and, and of course, we are uh, always have to keep an open mind to the possibility that uh, deep in Titan's interior, there may be, um, we think there's a, a, a global uh, water ocean. Um, uh, and there's even the possibility that uh, some of the functions of, of living things could be executed uh, in Titan's uh, surface liquid in, in a, a non-polar solvent. Um, we don't have a, any good ideas about exactly how that could happen, um, but we don't know enough to rule it out. And so we, you know, one has to keep that, that in mind uh, for, for exploration. So there were ideas uh, even in the 1990s, um, you know, Titan's got a thick atmosphere, so could you fly a balloon? Sure. Um, you can also use that dense atmosphere to deliver a lot more hardware into orbit than you can at a, a, an airless world like, um, like Europa, for example. If you use air capture to slow down, you don't need the same uh, rocket propulsion um, to break into orbit, and so you can you know, deliver a much more capable vehicle. Um, those ideas were kicked around in, in the um, 90s and early 2000s. Um, the question arose, however, you know, how can you access the surface material with a balloon? Um, you know, it's a great uh, aesthetically pleasing way to get around, um, but uh, you, you don't have much control authority um, and uh, interaction with the surface um, presents some, some challenges. Um, there were ideas about airships as well, and, and, and they mitigate some of those considerations, but, but only to an extent. Um, here at APL, we were tasked by NASA in 2007 uh, to sort of look at what would we want to do uh, at Titan after Cassini. And uh, there's many things that um, can be done from, from orbit. Um, a radar map from Cassini, for example, uh, only covers about 40, 50% of the, the body. Um, and the topography data is much more sparse than that. Um, obviously, Titan's atmospheric chemistry has seasonal changes. Uh, there's all kinds of things that um, even Cassini's instrumentation could have done much more extensively if Cassini had been in orbit around Titan. But because it only flew by uh, Titan once in, a, once in a while, it just had these sort of fleeting snapshots. Um, so a, a Titan orbiter would give, give amazing science. And you could also um, you know, improve the amount of uh, data you get from surface platforms by, by acting as a relay. Uh, we, we ventured a balloon as, as had done, been done before. Um, and we also suggested a, a lander. Uh, a lander lets you do things like seismology to probe the interior and maybe see how deep that, uh, that water ocean is. Um, and of course, you can access the surface material and, and really diagnose its uh, structure um, and composition. Um, so those three elements were sort of the, the you know, the perfect shopping list, um, but, you know, they, they add up to, to an expensive multi-element mission. Um, and uh, Europa um, uh, sort of um, took, the, took the lead in the uh, outer solar system flagship uh, um, set. Um, there were some smaller mission ideas that, that came along um, about a decade ago. There was the Titan Mare Explorer capsule, a, a capsule to splash down in, in one of Titan's northern seas. Um, it, um, it would have been on its way uh, right now if it had been selected to uh, you know, uh, arrive before uh, the end of northern summer. Um, northern summer lets you uh, see the sun and the earth from 
the North Polar regions, and that lets you do direct Earth communication. So you could do a mission um, within the, the very restricted um, you know, cost envelope of the, the NASA Discovery Program. Uh, there were even ideas about airplanes on Titan, uh, ones that would never never touch the ground, just keep flying, um, you know, ad infinitum. Um, those relied on a, a particular um, a power system that uh, was was not 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 realised, uh, at least not not yet. However, um, now back in uh, the late '90s, when uh, I was thinking with some, with colleagues at, at JPL about um, uh, airships and so on. We we're sort of confronted with the question of, you know, where does uh, an airship make sense? Uh, you know, where's the break point between heavier than air and lighter than air travel? And uh, you know, when you start looking into that quantitatively, you sort of realize that, hmm, wait, actually, the best way to explore Titan, if you're interested in accessing the surface, is is with uh, something like a helicopter, because you can spend most of your time sitting on the ground where you can do science. Um, and you could just take off once in a while um, and uh, you know relocate. So like having a lander that, that just lands at multiple places. And when you, you do the, the rotorcraft math, uh, taking into account the, the denser atmosphere on Titan uh, and the lower gravity, you know, it takes um, about 40 times less power to hover a given sized vehicle uh, on Titan than, than Earth. Um, and there's even some some additional benefits from the the, the low temperatures, but uh, you know I sort of proposed this this Titan helicopter thing, and it got this garish uh, cover on a new scientist. Um, but the the pieces weren't there. This was sort of before its time. This was before the drone revolution. Uh, there was not the uh, multi-mission radioisotope thermoelectric generator. There were just just notional um, radioisotope power sources. Um, you know, Titan is too far from the sun. Um, for for solar power to be to be effective, um, even uh, especially you know, on, on the surface. Um, so the the idea was there, but but it was um, it was it was too early uh, in in 2000. Um, but uh, the pieces have have emerged, uh, as you as you know, when you see any you know uh, airport gadget store, you can you know buy a buy a little quadcopter for for 20 bucks and fly it around. Um, we now have the multi-mission radioisotope uh, thermoelectric generator. You know, uh, a second one is is about to uh, to, to land on, on the Martian surface uh, next week. Um, in fact, I had the opportunity as my, my last trip um, before COVID uh, clipped my wings, uh, was out, actually out to the Idaho National Laboratory um, to see the uh, MMRTG that's on, on Perseverance. Um, I wanted to make some uh, measurements uh, about how the MMRTG affects the, um, the atmospheric electrical conductivity around it. it. The radiation causes a little bit of ionization, which um, actually affects some of the measurements that we would um, we we what we plan to make with uh, with Dragonfly. Um, I should stress that um, although uh, Dragonfly's uh, original design was uh, proposed with the MMRTG uh, strictly. Um, the use of uh, radioisotope power systems is subject to um, approval per the, the National Environmental Policy Act, and so there's um, some uh, approval processes uh, yet to be uh, performed before um, that uh, you know is, is sort of formally um, uh, uh, announced as, as our, our way forward. Um, so the the concept that um, you know I articulated back in 2000 and, and that we embrace for for Dragonfly is really driven by uh, the Titan day-night cycle. Um, you are, uh, if you're at low latitudes on Titan, then you are uh, blocked from the sun and the earth by, by Titan's interior. Um, earth and the sun are below the horizon. It's nighttime, it's dark, uh, you can't communicate. So we just sit and we take the 80 watts, 90 watts, whatever comes out of the uh, MMRTG, and we trickle charge a large battery. That's this blue curve charging up. Um, and that gives us the energy that we need uh, when we fly. We can only fly for half an hour, uh, an hour or so. Um, and that you know, uses most of that battery energy, uh, even though it's 40 times less than Earth, it's still a lot of power. Um, so we, uh, we charge up, um, basically doing nothing except um, listening with our seismometer, monitoring the weather during the, the night. Uh, and then when the sun comes up, uh, we um, downlink the, the data to the Earth. Um, we check the weather. We get approval from 
you know, ground control uh, and, and do our flight to, to a new place. Um, and then once we land, um, we recharge the battery for 16 hours and then we have a, you know, an eight hour downlink to the earth, uh, charge up, downlink, charge up, downlink. And you, you can see you know, we're, we're slowly eating into the battery reserve and, until at sunset where we have some comfortable margin, we just start charging up again. So, you know, this is much like the, the way, um, you know, rovers work on, on Mars, except you've, instead of having a 24 hour cycle and having to be on Mars time, you can basically be one week on and then one week off. Um, so there's a, a very um, sort of comfortable uh, working cadence, um, but this architecture really drives us to have a, a very big battery, um, but, but it makes us resilient to the performance of the radioisotope power system. You know, as the, uh, as the plutonium decays, it just takes a, a little bit longer to, to charge the battery up so you know, we can fly a little bit less often. Um, so it's um, uh, you know, an architecture that, that really is um, driven by the, the Titan environment. Now, the, the vehicle we ended up with um, may, may, be, um, may be pretty ugly as, as uh, aircraft go. And um, uh, Mike Kinzel, uh, at whose invitation I'm, I'm speaking to you, uh, you know, likes to joke that you know, Dragonfly has all this junk on it, all these drag causing um, elements, which are, are, of course, the whole reason we're going. The scientific instruments are you know, what, what the, the purpose of the mission is. Um, but you know, nobody has ever seen a vehicle like this before because it's got some really quite unique attributes. I mean, okay, it's, it, it flies like a, like a rotorcraft, like a, one of these uh, urban air mobility taxis that are emerging. You've got similar sized sort of rotor blades. Um, here's a, a life size one with the, uh, the principal investigator of the mission, uh, Zippy Turtle. Um, we have to communicate directly to Earth, so we have to have a dish. Um, it's about uh, uh, one meter wide. It's actually not a dish in the, the parabolic sense. It's uh, actually a flat circular uh, uh, antenna array um, that uh, you know we we get a one or two kilobits a second um, uh, performance to 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 the ground. Um, but uh, obviously we retract that for for flight. Uh, we have some. Uh, panoramic cameras that are mounted on the same gimbal as the, the high gain. Um, the uh, radioisotope power generators at the back. Uh, we have drills. Um, not many aircraft have drills. Um, that's a that's a new one. And you know, drill people like uh, like vehicles to be heavy, right? You want to want to lean on the drill, get a, a lot of what they call weight on bit, um, and that's sort of anathema to to aircraft practice. And you know, this whole thing has to fly through space. Um, to get to where it's going. And so it has to fit inside a, a heat shield, which is why the, the front looks uh, ugly and blunt. Uh, it's, it's actually driven by the, the contours of the, the aeroshell. So there's a lot of very interesting uh, and unusual compromises to be made in, in, in putting a vehicle like this together. Um, the um, uh, mission concept has us arriving at Titan um, in a hypersonic aeroshell, just like um, uh, Perseverance is. Um, the, uh, mechanics of the Titan atmosphere are such that it takes uh, a couple of hours actually to float down by parachute to the surface, not the seven minutes of terror on Mars, but uh, you know, two hours of mild concern. Um, we'll release from the aeroshell um, about a kilometer above the ground um, and land under, under rotor power. Um, so you know, once, you, once you go through the exercise of figuring out what you need to soft land on Titan, uh, with hazard avoidance and things like that, then you don't add, need to add anything to, to take off and fly somewhere new. Um, that's sort of the, the beauty of the concept. Um, we have some great animations of, of this stuff happening uh, at our website, uh, dragonfly.jhuapl.edu. Uh, there's a lot of uh, other resources there, um, some papers, uh, uh, graphics, and uh, um, uh, movies. Um, in terms of uh, atmospheric flight mechanics, um, the um, uh, power to hover, as I said, is sort of 40 times what it what it would be, uh, 40 times less than what it would be on Earth. Um, it's still several kilowatts, um, and like any flying thing, um, there's actually a, a non-monotonic power versus flight speed curve. Uh, when you're in hover, 
uh, you don't have much drag because you're not moving relative to the air, but um, the efficiency of the rotors in providing the, the full set of, uh, you know, the full amount of lift is, is a little bit less than, than in, in some cruise condition where you're sort of not optimally forcing air in, into, the, into the rotors. And then as you fly even faster still, the, the drag eventually dominates. And so there's a, you know, a minimum sort of optimum cruise speed. And this is for a, an old, old design, but broadly it's similar. So you know, our optimum flight speed, something like 20 miles an hour. Um, and, and what we'll do um, after that first landing, and we'll, we'll stay on, on the ground at that site for um, probably several months actually, um, and then do a couple of you know little gingerly hops to to check out the the uh, the flight control system and the the navigation and so on. Um, but uh, we should be able to fly for perhaps uh, up to twenty kilometers. I mean, a, a sort of informal goal uh, when we were formulating this mission was that you know we should be able to fly further in one flight than any Mars rover has ever driven. Uh, and I think technically we we could do that if we you know melt the battery. Um, but you know, with the usual sort of flight rules of land with 50% battery margin, you know, we probably aren't going to quite do that. Um, but what this lets us do actually is uh, fly off from our, our landing site and scout somewhere new, um, uh, zap it with a lidar, take stereo pictures to to measure the topography, um, and then fly back to to where we started from uh, because we know it's safe. And then we can downlink that data to the ground and study it in depth over the Titan night, for example, and then decide if that's where we want to go. And um, and if not, we can decide to scout somewhere else. Um, obviously, the first time we go to B and come back to A, but then we can fly over to C, uh, come back to B because we've already scouted it. And so we can do this sort of two steps forward, one step back um, scouting, wherein we, we never commit to landing at somewhere that we're not absolutely um, uh, happy to, to, to go to. Um, the flight mechanics are complex on a vehicle like this. And um, this is a graphic that I, I got from, from Mike Kinzel, who's been doing um, uh, amazing uh, CFD work, uh, simulating the airflow uh, on the vehicle, the, the identifying the areas that, that create the worst drag, like, like the nose and these pesky science instruments. Um, the, the interaction between the rotors is actually kind of interesting. You know, at certain flight speeds, the, the downwash from the forward upper rotor impinges on the rear uh, lower rotor, and that creates some, you know, interesting interactions. Um, so, that, you know, there's a lot to, lot to figure out. Um, when we started working with some uh, rotorcraft people, uh, you know, they were actually kind of um, backward facing baseball caps kind of tinkerers. Um, and, and those aren't the people you want for um, a, a space mission where you need to be sure that it's going to work when it gets to a, a new environment. You need that, that sort of fundamental understanding of the, the aerodynamics and the aeromechanics. And uh, um, our colleagues at Penn State and, uh, and Mike Kinzel at UCF are, are a big part of that. Um, <clears throat> to be sure that's going to work, um, you want to um, uh, check uh, the CFD against uh, physical measurements in a wind tunnel. Um, and we've been doing those uh, in, in the fall already. Um, that's been a challenge, of course, with the COVID um, era and uh, there's restrictions on uh, accessing sites like, uh, like NASA. Uh, we, this, this, these uh, rotor tests were done on a, a test stand in the 14 by 22 tunnel um, to, to look at some of these rotor interactions with the flow at different angles. Um, in fact, the, the blade section for um, the rotors is in some respects more uh, typical for wind turbines on Earth. Uh, the reason being that the Titan atmosphere is very cold and that reduces the viscosity of nitrogen. So you, you in effect get to uh, fly in a cryogenic wind tunnel where the, the Reynolds number is, is higher. Um, so um, that's, that's been a, uh, an interesting activity in the, the last few months with its, uh, its own challenges. Um, another NASA center, NASA Goddard, um, provides us the, um, the sort of centerpiece instrument for, for Dragonfly, um, a mass spectrometer that will uh, analyze the surface material and uh, tell us what, uh, what it's made of. Um, it's similar to um, uh, an instrument on um, Curiosity and on the upcoming ExoMars rover. Um, but with a very wide mass range. I mean, whereas Mars, uh, looking for organics, you're looking for a, a needle in a haystack. 
um, but but Titan is drenched in in organics, and so we we need um, a pretty advanced instrument to sort of tease them all apart. And so there are um, gas chromatograph uh, front ends and a laser desorption front end. Um, we can easily even tease apart uh, with the gas chromatograph um, the so-called uh, chiral uh, amino acids. Um, they're all, if, if, I always get this wrong, uh, all the amino acids that living things on earth use are left-handed and the sugars are right-handed, or maybe it's the other way around. They're, they're structurally the same, but mirror image of each other. And the fact that they're all one, um, one-handedness, if you like, is, is characteristic of the sort of self-selection that, that living things do. Um, there are amino acids in meteorites, for example, and they're pretty much 50-50 left and right-handed. So you know, understand if we go to Titan and find um, that there's uh, this in anti selectivity that everything's one handed or the other, that would be uh, a very exciting development that would say that there's been some sort of selection process that doesn't happen on, on meteorites, for example. Um, getting the uh, sample uh, into the instrument uh, is uh, an interesting challenge, um, especially in Titan's cryogenic uh, conditions. You know, it's 94 Kelvin, so motors, um, you know, need to be heated up, uh, lubricants, um, you know, have, have challenges. Um, we didn't want to use a big heavy arm. Um, we actually have a, a drill fixed to each skid, and we use a pneumatic uh, transfer system to basically suck the cuttings up uh, into the instrument, and we can use a little valve system to switch from, from which drill and to which uh, which instrument it goes. Um, there's a, actually a very cool um, uh, video of this on, on YouTube that our uh, colleagues at Honeybee Robotics in Pasadena put together. Um, they're, they're a really fun, fun bunch uh, to, to work with. Um, they, we, we've got a, a full-scale um, uh, development unit um, was was done in the, the phase A study before we were selected to fly. In fact, um, and uh, you know it, it, we tested it in in cryogenic conditions and in various kinds of surface material, sticky stuff, uh, frozen ice, frozen ammonia solution, um, uh, dry powders that are you know electrostatically clingy. You know you try to challenge the system in in every way you you think it it might encounter to see to see at what point it it doesn't work. Um, uh, that's a, a really fun sort of exercise. Um, the, the drill bit is, is actually conical, so it won't get stuck. Um, and it just kind of scoops out this, this pile of cuttings and the cuttings are um, sucked away by this sort of uh, uh, vacuum horn. Um, the, the sample gets um, trapped in these little uh, cups that get um, um, uh, moved uh, to the, the, the instrument front end and the stuff that blows past the cup gets, just gets exhausted through this uh, blower uh, out the side. But uh, uh, as I say, I urge you to have a look at the, uh, the video on YouTube. It's, it's really kind of fun. Um, we have a, a, an instrument to do some reconnaissance of the chemistry uh, before we even commit to sampling the material. Um, there are uh, elements um, in planetary crust that uh, emit gamma rays when they're um, stimulated by neutrons. This has been um, used at Mars, at asteroids, at the moon. Um, but it, those bodies rely on cosmic rays to do the excitation. Uh, and Titan's atmosphere is so thick that the cosmic rays don't get through to the ground. Um, so we actually have to bring our own neutrons. Um, we use a pulse neutron generator, which is um, a device used in uh, oil exploration. You know, they lower these things down, down boreholes and shoot out neutrons and measure the gamma rays that, that, that come back. And those are diagnostic of, you know, how much hydrogen, how much oxygen, how much carbon, how much magnesium and sulfur uh, is, is in the surface material. And, and, and those all, those, uh, inf the, that information, which we don't need to, to drill or anything to do, we just sit there and shoot out these neutrons. Um, Will will help inform, uh, you know, whether the stuff is 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 interesting, uh, and we want want to drill it to that particular site because we may visit, um, you know, several dozen sites, maybe maybe as many as forty, uh, and uh, you know, we may not want to drill at, at, at all of them. Um, we'll have cameras, of course, uh, cameras um, looking forward, uh, and these will take 
images during during atmospheric flight as well as sitting on the ground um, like these um, uh, Mars rover images. There's a sort of belly mounted downward camera, um, particularly for, for, for mapping during flight, but also uh, the downward camera will give us a view of where the uh, the drills will be, would be drilling um, so we can see the texture of the material. We have a sort of zoom uh, camera, microscopic imager that will be able to image the individual sand grains um, and uh, inform us what kind of processes have shaped the, the surface material. And, and also, is it does it look glisten? Uh, does it look like it's sticky? Uh, and we have a couple of panoramic cameras to do stereo uh, and panoramic imaging um, using the high gain antenna uh, gimbal to, to pan around. Um, so the, you know, these will be spectacular images that of an entirely new landscape and in all kinds of different views. Um, there's a couple of other other tricks. Um, you know, at night uh, when it's mostly dark, um, there's actually a surprisingly long twilight on Titan because of the the scattering in the atmosphere. Um, we can illuminate uh, the area under the lander with some uh, light emitting diodes at different wavelengths, and those give us sort of you know super color vision that. Um, uh, is somewhat compositionally diagnostic. Um, this is um, actually two different near-infrared um, channels mapped to um, uh, red and, and green and uh, blue light to, to blue light, more or less. Um, but these different colors are different kind of organic uh, compounds in this uh, ice, ice um, organic mixture. Um, and many organic compounds, uh, especially those with, with sort of uh, carbon loops, um, aromatics, um, are uh, fluorescent. When you illuminate the scene with um, uh, ultraviolet light, they, they glow. Uh, you might be familiar if you, you know, go to a, a, a nightclub with a gin and tonic uh, because the quinine uh, in the tonic uh, fluoresces under UV and, and glows blue. And so at night we'll, we'll shoot out uh, some UV light and see whether the, the ground glows, uh, which I think will be, be kind of fun uh, as well as scientifically interesting. Um, I have some particular responsibility for the um, the DragMet instrument, the uh, geophysics and meteorology package. Uh, we'll measure the methane humidity, the atmospheric temperature and pressure, uh, the winds, um, and uh, look for uh, not only um, you know minute to minute, hour to hour uh, diurnal variations uh, on the surface, but also we'll profile these. Um, these uh, atmospheric properties uh, in the atmosphere by by flying up to a few kilometers and, and, and back down. Um, we also uh, have some sensors on the skids uh, to um, determine some of the, the physical properties of the surface. Um, and we have uh, geophones and a, a seismometer to look for titan quakes. Um, and uh, those may help us uh, figure out how deep, uh, how thick the crust is on Titan above the, uh, the internal uh, water ocean. Uh, and in fact, the uh, seismometer is a, a contribution from the, the Japanese uh, aerospace agency, JAXA. Um, they had a, a seismometer uh, developed for a, a previous mission that um, we felt would uh, likely work well at the, the very low temperatures on Titan. And, and indeed, uh, we, we, we tested it and it, and it does. Um, the mission timeline is such that we are uh, planning to uh, 2027 launch with arrival in the mid 2030s, um, basically the same uh, latitude and, and time of year as, as the Huygens probe. So we can use the Huygens information as, as sort of ground truth. And then our uh, nominal mission, I think now is 3.3 um, uh, years, uh, during which time we'll, we'll make um, probably one flight every month or so, every, every two Titan days. Um, and that will let us uh, cover um, perhaps a couple of hundred kilometers uh, of forward progress. The, um, the area that we're going to um, with the initial landing ellipse is an area that we um, know from Cassini data to have uh, sand dunes. Um, these dunes here are about um, three or four kilometers apart. Um, and up here is a radar image of Earth uh, of the Egyptian desert um, showing this same sort of linear tapering morphology and uh, basically the sort of gravel plains and um, these uh, these dunes, which you know have sharp um, sharp crests, but they have broad flat plinths that are going to be easy to land on, and the area between the dunes should be uh, pretty favourable too. So we're we're pretty confident um, that um, we can find some some good safe landing sites to begin with, and then we can scout 
right? We'll, we'll want to go more interesting places uh, than, than just uh, um, sand dunes, um, but uh, that, that's a, a good safe place to start. Um, look, taking a, a bit of a step back, this, this is our target crater Selk, um, basically was in the middle of the map uh, that I showed uh, uh, earlier on. Um, so we'll land down here um, in the dunes where we, we are pretty um, assured of a, a safe first landing, and then we'll scout and progressively move towards the crater where other Cassini data suggests that this is um, uh, water bearing material was thrown out during the impact and may have done some of that, um, that really interesting chemistry that I, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so last couple of slides. Um, What's going on right now, uh, we're in phase B, so uh, refining requirements and um, uh, doing the, the detailed design. Uh, also, there's some uh, technology maturation um, you know, early on in the process. You know, for example, the, the drill system, um, you know, we tested at low temperature, uh, which we think is the, the hard thing, um, you know, making sure that um, you know, the, the, the drill and the blower work. Um, but to really be certain of the performance, you want to get the Titan temperature and pressure right. The Titan surface pressure is about uh, 1.6 Earth um, atmospheres. Um, and so we've actually commissioned a, a dedicated uh, chamber here at APL um, that, um, you know, unusually for a space facility, you know, over pressures goes up to 1.6 in, instead of just down to vacuum. Um, and um, you know, we use gallons and gallons of liquid nitrogen to, to, to do this. Um, but we, we've put in um, um, elements such like such as the, um, the shock absorbers, the dampers for the for the landing system, uh, some of our meteorological instrumentation, um, and in fact the um, the blower uh, system for the um, for the the, the sampling uh, system that was tested just before Christmas. Um, and so there's a you know a lot of uh, testing going on to to demonstrate the technical uh, maturity of, of various elements. Um, I talked about the, the wind tunnel tests. Um, we have a, a sort of subscale um, uh, drone unit for um, testing some of the autopilot uh, algorithms. Um, remember, there's no no GPS on Titan, so we have to use um, inertial navigation um, uh, coupled with uh, vision-based uh, terrain uh, terrain relative navigation. Um, and we've tested those algorithms out, and they, um, you know, they they work very well. Um, uh, but having a small scale platform is is, is obviously uh, very convenient. This is the sort of testing that's very hard to do on something like uh, the descent stage of a Mars rover, where you know it's rocket propulsion and so on. But you can take a, a, a drone, albeit a lightweight one, on Earth, and, and do a lot of the the field testing uh, of, of uh, uh, many of the hardware elements. So um, there's a lot going on. Um, we are, you know, working towards a launch still some years away, um, and arrival, um, you know, a decade and a half away. Uh, but it's going to be an exciting adventure, and I hope you'll be able to uh, follow uh, along with us uh, via uh, NASA uh, media and uh, our uh, APL website um, down there. So um, with that, I'll stop, and um, uh, we'll see how to deal with questions. Chris, do you want to? Um, Maybe MC the questions, just uh, read them out to me, or or tell me I should look at the chat, or or how do you want to do it? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so, uh, in fact, um, even by terrestrial standards, the Titan winds are, are actually quite gentle. Um, so, you know, one one meter a second near the, near the surface. Um, we have some measurements from uh, Cassini uh, from Huygens that that you know, measure just how how turbulent it, it was, and um, parts of the Huygens descent were what uh, you'd call in terrestrial aviation uh, light turbulence. Um, we, we intend to do most of our atmospheric flights um, around 9, 9.30 a.m. 
local solar time when the um, atmosphere will be relatively quiescent. You don't have a lot of um, convection uh, like as builds up in the, the afternoon. Um, but the, the vehicle uh, will uh, take wind readings before it takes off. In fact, there'll be kind of two cycles. We'll take uh, wind readings um, and uh, look at the weather overnight um, and send that back to Earth and we'll you know, make a go, no go decision on, on the ground. Um, and then we basically hand it off to, to the vehicle. And the vehicle will, will look at the wind sensors itself up to you know, a minute before takeoff. And if it senses that the winds are greater than some threshold that we'll fine tune, but probably one, uh, two meters a second or so, um, then, then we'll just veto the flight, say, mm, looks windy, let's uh, think about this carefully. Um, so, you know, we, 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 we have that, um, that, that sort of opportunity to, um, uh, sorry, this is pretty funny. Um, to only fly when we're, we're comfortable with the weather. Uh, and we, you know, we have um, numerical models, um, not only at the global scale, but at the, the sort of landscape scale that are, you know, explicitly uh, looking at, you know, how much does the wind uh, speed up as it goes over the crest of a dune, for example, you know, how the terrain affects the wind, we're, we're building up that capability. So, you know, we're, um, we're, we're going to be pretty well informed, I think, about the environment. I'm not hearing anything. Um, is there another question? Ah, sorry. Yeah, 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 sure. Um, so the next, the next question is, is it possible that the rotors can dig holes under the drone as it's trying to land, causing its skids to set down at an odd angle? Uh, that's um, that's a, a great question, and I, I'm actually really interested in, in that. Um, that was something we looked at very early on. Um, I uh, uh, among my um, books, you'll um, you'll notice one about about sand dunes. Uh, I'm very interested in this this problem. One of the key things we want to learn about Titan is exactly at what speed does the sand start to move, because uh, you need to know that in order to be able to decode what the shape of the dunes are telling you about, um, about Titan's climate history. Um, and one way we'll, we'll, we'll do that is by um, actually firing up like a single rotor at um, a set of different speeds um, and um, uh, looking with the cameras and some sensors on the skids to detect at what speed the, um, uh, the, the sand starts moving. Um, so that, that's one of the, the relatively few ways that Dragonfly actually manipulates the surface material is with the, the downwash from the, the rotors. Um, we have also looked at uh, the, what's called the brownout phenomenon, uh, wherein the, the downwash from the rotors uh, kicks up surface dust and, and makes a, a dust cloud. Um, there were actually quite a few um, uh, helicopter accidents in um, Afghanistan, for example, um, during uh, military operations there um, that were caused because there was a lot of um, uh, erasable dust in the, the, the surface material and that, that basically uh, obscures the ground and the, the pilots get disoriented and, um, uh, and, 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 and crashes have occurred. Um, that's arguably less of a concern for an autonomous vehicle because you know, with the inertial guidance, it, it knows what level is, uh, at least for the you know, a few seconds or tens of seconds coming into land. Um, but we, we do use a LIDAR uh, to sense our, our altitude near the ground and to um, uh, detect rocks so we can avoid landing in, in rocky areas. Um, and potentially the brownout cloud could uh, obscure the ground um, to that, that LIDAR interrogation. Um, uh, so we, we veto the, the LIDAR below 10 meters altitude because because of the possibility of, of, of kicking up dust. Um, so it's, it's definitely something um, we're, we're paying attention to. And in fact, um, Mike Kinzel's uh, CFD is uh, really helping us understand uh, um, you know, the, the flow field interaction with the ground. Um, so yeah, it's something, something that's uh, quite unusual for, for spacecraft to have to worry about, but uh, we're definitely paying attention. 
Okay, so the next question is, can you elaborate on the purpose and operation of the gamma ray spectrometers? Uh, yeah, um, so uh, its function is to, uh, well, actually there's, there's three elements to it. There is the pulse neutron generator that shoots neutrons out. Um, there's a gamma ray spectrometer which detects uh, the gamma rays emitted by certain uh, elements in the ground. Um, and there's also a couple of neutron detectors. Uh, the neutron detectors are particularly good for um, measuring how, uh, how much hydrogen there is in the ground. So um, you could imagine we might land um, at somewhere that looks dark, like that, uh, that Huygens image. And that probably means it's carbon rich. Um, but is it um, carbon like carbon black, all carbon, or is it um, carbon and nitrogen, like some of the material we can make in the lab uh, in, in Titan simulations? Um, and, and the gamma ray spectrometer will basically tell us the um, relative amounts of hydrogen, uh, nitrogen, carbon, uh, oxygen, uh, and some uh, other elements like sodium. Um, sulfur, chlorine. So, um, you know, is it uh, just uh, carbon rich sand or is it mixed with water ice, for example? Um, if it's water ice um, that may have, you know, come up from deep in Titan's interior, uh, is it salty uh, or, or is, it, is, it, is it fresh? Uh, is it doped with, with ammonia? So it's, um, you know, it's a, a coarse um, compositional indication. It only tells us the, um, the elemental composition doesn't tell us the, the structure how the how the elements are, are st stuck together but it uh, it's very very complementary to the mass spectrometer in that it gives us this quick reconnaissance it just takes uh, an hour to 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 accumulate a gamma ray spectrum and you don't need to drill or anything to to do it um, so it's very complementary to the uh, the other uh, investigation okay how many rpms do the rotors spin at and how does it compare to those to the Earth-based test article. Um, so the the rotor um, speed is, uh, I think, typically something like 800 RPM. Actually, Mike probably knows more than I do. Um, uh, I don't know what the test article is because that, that, that's a, a smaller uh, rotor. Um, so it, the, it's probably faster. I mean, the, the way um, to uh, validate uh, a, a spacecraft design um, is is not to completely replicate everything on Earth because you just can't because the gravity is wrong for a start. Um, you know the approach is um, very much to have an understanding, a, a, you know, a model for how things work, um, and to calibrate that model uh, with um, wind tunnel data, with field test data of a, a lightweight article, a small scale article, you know, whatever it is. Um, but um, uh, the, the the rotor speed is is uh, relatively slow compared to um, most hobby drones, let's say, because they're 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 small and and uh, have have quite high rates. So, how deep are the methane seas on Titan? Oh, um, uh, that's uh, been a, a, a topic of much of my my previous work, actually. Um, this is not the best map for it, but it's the only map I've got got here. So uh, Dragonfly is destined to go here, Selk. Um, and it's further than we can realistically fly in our nominal mission to, to visit the seas, which are in, in winter darkness when Dragonfly arrives, by the way. Um, this sea here, 400 kilometers across, this is a cylindrical projection. So the, the polar regions are kind of stretched. This sea, Ligia Mare, is 400 kilometers across. And we actually have uh, Cassini data um, with its uh, radar pointing downwards that uh, went across here uh, and that we actually picked up a bottom echo um, that relies on liquid methane being extremely uh, radio transparent, um, which is very different from water, of course. Um, and the, the time at which that echo came back tells us very unambiguously that the depth of Ligia was about 130 meters. Uh, we have a, another couple of measurements uh, here and here, and they were, I don't know, 80 meters, 50 meters. Um, we don't actually know how deep the deepest part of Kraken is because we didn't get an echo. Um, maybe we didn't get an echo because it's actually made of um, less pure methane. 
maybe there's more ethane and uh, hydrogen cyanide and other stuff that's more radar absorbing. So you know we just looked into the abyss and, and didn't see um, didn't see it come the echo come back. Or, or it might be that it's actually you know 800 meters deep and, and and again the depth is just so much that the echo is too weak. So we don't know for sure, but probably a few hundred meters. Um, this one we know is 130. So if you uh, look at, at all this surface area and take the, the depth uh, into account, there's um, more liquid um, methane here um, by a factor of about 200 than all the liquid um, hydrocarbon reserves, uh, oil and gas um, known on Earth. Um, so it's just sitting there waiting for you to pick up. There's no oxygen to burn it in out of Titan, but um, you know, that's a separate issue. So what is a forecasted operating mission lifetime of Dragonfly on Titan? So the, um, the mission um, duration um, over which we expect to attain all of our science objectives to, to go from our initial landing site um, and to, um, sorry, I'm jumping forward, I should have quit and gone back in. So go from our landing site and to, to access uh, some of this um, uh, impact material, perhaps even in the crater itself. Um, that is um, set for, I think, 3.3 years. Um, nothing mechanically happens at that point. Um, the radioisotope thermoelectric generator will be um, degrading in output by a couple of percent a year. Um, the um, Obviously, the longer emission runs, the more probability that something starts to wear out. Um, we, we don't have an unlimited number of the little sample cups for the mass spectrometer instrument, but there's absolutely no reason um, the mission couldn't continue um, you know, well beyond the 3.3 the, the years. But you know, as an engineer, you have to um, figure out the requirement and design to the requirement, and then anything you get beyond that is, is gravy. Okay, here's a, now I'm going to the chat questions. Um, are there decisions for landing made by an integrated system on Dragonfly or being made in Earth? Um, it, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, it's, um, it's sort of a combination of the two. The, the onboard autonomy um, is um, not unsophisticated, but it, it's not doing any science decisions. Um, so basically, uh, all right, the first landing, um, basically we come out from under the chute and we won't know exactly where we are. Uh, the vehicle will just look for somewhere that's safe. Um, you know, it has a LIDAR on board to sense, uh, you know, slopes and uh, obstacles, and it will just find a spot that doesn't have steep slopes and obstacles and it'll set down. Then once we're down, we'll have the aerial imaging taken during the flight. Um, and we can take a panorama and look around and you know we deliberate on the ground where we might want to go next so what we would then do is instruct dragonfly to take off go over there and scout it um, to shoot the ground with the lidar take stereo images but come back to where um, we, we we know it's safe where it originated now when it comes into land it's using its lidar again um, and to make sure we don't you know, put down on a big rock. Um, so the, the onboard autopilot is basically, you know, just tells it to follow the line, you know, whatever the bearing is that the ground team has, has, has instructed or has requested. You know, it has to, has to fight against crosswinds perhaps. Um, and so it you know, uses inertial guidance uh, supplement, supplemented by, by ground image correlation um, but you know that's um, that's uh, that's not um, you know artificial intelligence or anything um, fancy like that. It's uh, a, a relatively low level of uh, autonomous flight. Are we going to be able to see videos um, from the from Dragonfly, or is the data flux too low? Um, I'm certain that um, we will have. Um, some concatenated imagery. Um, I'm, I'm sure everyone's going to want to see that. Um, it, it's definitely true 
that um, being um, you know ten times further away from Earth than than Mars is, say, and without having relay orbiters, the the bandwidth is going to be much less um, than than you're used to for for Mars rovers. But you know we have three years, uh, which is you know a lot of time to send um, data down, and um, you know one thing um, one degree of freedom we have is that the energy that we um, expend um, in, in powered flight, uh, we can repurpose, right? We don't, we don't fly uh, every Titan day. The sort of nominal plan is we do one day on, one day off. And, and during those days when we don't fly, we have a full battery that we can um, expend the energy sending data back to Earth more often than we would if we were, we were um, you know, spending a lot of the energy on flight. So there, there'll be this, um, I'm sure there'll be a, a tension between, um, you know, uh, the, the wish to send more, more pictures, more data back um, versus to, to do more flying. Um, but I, I could well imagine that um, the, the temptation to have uh, some moving pictures will be, will be overpowering. Um, and I think it'll be, be amazing. Is Vortex ring state a concern? If so, how is it addressed? They, they keep asking me the questions that should go to you. Um, do you want to take that, Mike? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had been looking at that uh, quite a bit. Um, basically, one of the nice things about, one of the things that we're finding is that these coaxial rotors are actually less prone to Vortex ring state. It, it's actually, and and, and because of that, we don't feel like it's going to be a concern. And it's only a concern in one point of the flight envelope. And I think that we have so much margin at that point in the flight envelope. It, it's really, it's, it's kind of been addressed or addressed and kind of, you know, it's no longer really a concern in the context of it. Yeah. I mean, we, we've, we've paid attention to it. We've um, identified the, um, you know, the, the, the points in the envelope where, um, those uh, rotor wake interactions could occur um, and, and we'll avoid them. So basically, you know, thou shalt not descend relatively quickly vertically because then you, you go through your, you go through your wake. Um, so the, you know, the approach to come into land is, is a very slow descent, you know, less than a, a meter per second. Whereas the, um, you know, the downwash coming out of the rotors is uh, several meters a second. Um, so we've definitely paid attention to that, and uh, as Mike says, the um, the coaxial rotor pairs are are more forgiving in that respect than a, than a single rotor would be. Okay, um, do you have any other ideas brewing up in follow up missions? Maybe a drone in the ocean? <laughs> <laughs> this isn't cool enough for you, really. Um, so um, that that would be a, a actually a really um, you know, fun mission to uh, to put together. Uh, I, I did a little bit of work um, uh, on some ideas for a Titan submarine, um, but I, I think that's uh, that's some ways away. Uh, and in fact, a lot of what you could get from a submarine, you could get from a a, a boat with um, sort of instrumented depth charges, if you like. Um, but um, a, another um, a thing you you could imagine and, and clearly have. Is is a rotorcraft with, um, you know, pontoons, um, you know, where you could, um, you know, land on land or land on the liquid. Um, the challenge, of course, is never in showing that some particular uh, space vehicle uh, is possible uh, or that it could probably work. The, the challenge is showing that it definitely, definitely will work with no problem. And when you start introducing the degrees of freedom of um, uh, powered landing on a liquid surface that might have waves, um, you know, it, 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 it becomes very difficult to be absolutely certain that uh, you've uh, anticipated all the all the possible interactions. So again, I think we're we're some way uh, away from from that. Um, you know, going back to uh, you know these uh, these ideas um, that came along as soon as you know Cassini had sort of. Uh, confronted uh, Titan, you know, there's a lot of things you can do uh, on on the ground from a lander. You know, the surface chemistry, the seismology, the meteorological monitoring. There's a set of things you can do uh, from from the air 
uh, you know, landscape scale uh, imaging, uh, understanding different aspects of the atmospheric dynamics. And, and we kind of get that twofer with Dragonfly, right? It, it's doing the functions, doing the science of um, a lander, but multiplying it by, by 20 or 40 landing sites. Um, and we're getting the aerial vistas, but we're not doing the global survey that an orbiter will do. Um, and so there's still very much a scientific need for a follow-on uh, Titan orbiter. And I, I, th I suspect that would, that would be the next step after Dragonfly um, and you know, more exotic surface vehicles uh, or, or more Dragonflies. I mean, Dragonfly is going to do um, just regional exploration around here. There's all kinds of interesting places uh, to explore on Titan. Um, so I, I, think, I think the next step would probably be most appropriately an orbiter, but, uh, but who knows? Okay, here's, um, I think we got two more questions so far. Is there a concern with brownout clouding the lenses with sand? How is the instrumentation kept clean? Um, that's uh, an excellent question. And, and yes, indeed, we have um, considered that. And in fact, some of, um, I was actually working on some slides on that um, earlier today for, uh, for our uh, internal uh, work on this. Um, what am I looking for? I'm looking for the picture back here. Uh, so, so one point is that the, um, uh, the, the stereo cameras are in this um, um, uh, sort of housing that's, that's uh, retracted when the, the, the dish is, um, is, is retracted for flight. So the, the panoramic cameras are, uh, are protected uh, during, during flight. Um, the other cameras are all on the belly or uh, forward. So, um, you know, dust lofted uh, into the atmosphere that, that settles out um, won't settle on, on the lenses. Um, now, you're right, um, the, the, in coming into land, you can kick up um, material from the surface and the turbulent recirculation can, can bring that up to the vehicle. And we've actually been um, calculating, um, in, including using some of um, Mike Kinzel's uh, CFD results, um, just how much uh, surface material could be transported. Um, during the, the phase A study, uh, we um, uh, developed and tested um, uh, some uh, dedicated coatings for the, the camera windows. Um, and um, uh, there's uh, low surface energy uh, perfluorosilane coatings that, um, that are, are very hard to stick to. Um, and um, by putting a, an indium tin, tin, yeah, indium tin oxide coating that makes them electrically conductive, um, that prevents the electrostatic adhesion. So we have a, a fair degree of um, protection just from those coatings. Um, and uh, the studies we've, we've done um, seem to be showing that um, there should not be um, uh, significant adhesion of material to the, the windows. Uh, but that, that's, a, that's an ongoing study. Um, it's possible uh, to uh, add windshield wipers or um, uh, covers. Um, but then you have to carry them around, right? Uh, uh, an aerial vehicle, you, you want to be uh, as lightweight uh, as possible. And, um, you know, it's, uh, there's, there's multiple uh, apertures that would all need their own covers and need heaters for the motors to drive them. And, and so you really have to, um, you know, consider very carefully, is, does the hazard um, merit that, that additional um, uh, protection? So... Here's another question. How does planetary protection protocols work on a mission like this? Uh, great, great question. Um, so we are working with the uh, Planetary Protection Office um, at NASA headquarters on um, defining the, the formal uh, posture for uh, Dragonfly. Um, but um, uh, Titan is um, what is called a uh, let me get this right, cat two star. Um, there are uh, higher categorizations of, of locations in the solar system, like um, areas on Mars that have, may have water uh, or uh, Europa, where in principle, um, if you took a space vehicle that had terrestrial biota on it, um, they could flourish and, and thereby you know, disrupt any native ecosystem. Um, Titan is, um, as far as we can tell, um, 
dead. Um, you know, it, it's of great interest in terms of the origin of life, the chemical steps um, that, that may lead up to, to life, but we have no prior expectation of um, living things on Titan. Um, if it's life as we know it, then it can only be in the deep interior, you know, under 100 kilometers of ice. So there is no realistic way to introduce um, material from Dragonfly to that environment. Even the MMRTG isn't, isn't powerful enough to, to melt its way down. Um, life as we don't know it is going to be operating on a completely different chemistry from terrestrial biota. And terrestrial biota simply can't flourish at 94 Kelvin. So um, I think the, the expectation would be that Titan's categorization as two star, which is of interest for origins of life, but not expected to, to have life. Um, that just requires analysis to show, you know, you're not going to melt through the crust um, or, or deliver terrestrial biota to an environment they could flourish in. Um, uh, and so there's no sterilization uh, required uh, of the vehicle. Um, but as I say, that, um, that, that posture uh, it has to be formally uh, signed off with the, um, uh, the, the NASA headquarters planetary protection office. But uh, it, it's, it was the case for Huygens. It was the case for other Titan mission studies that um, this, this category two star applies. Okay, we've got another question. How is um, the thermal heating from entry compare with MSL Mars 2020? And is it essentially the same aero shell? Um, Pika? Right. Um, I don't know if the thermal protection material is. Oh, it must be because we we talked about that. Um, so the um, aeroshell shape is um, actually um, slightly different from MSL. It's more like uh, the Genesis capsule, um, and the reason for that is. The Titan's atmosphere is mostly nitrogen, not CO2, and I think there's something about the ratio of specific heats and um, how that um, maps into the hypersonic stability of a, of a given shape. Um, uh, it, it, it has to have the same uh, access uh, to install the MMRTG, um, you know, on the uh, at the launch site uh, as as MSL does. Um, the uh, thermal protection material. Um, uh, we plan is is Pika, um, which is uh, obviously been been used on on past missions. Um, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head what the heat flux is, um, but it's not um, it, it's comparable with with Mars missions. It's not nearly as stressing as say the Earth return capsules uh, for Apollo or Osiris Rex or um, or Hayabusa. Um, you know, the entry speed at Titan is um, six or seven kilometers a second, um, you know, which is comparable with Earth orbit return at, at Earth or, or Mars entries. So I do have one more question. Mm -hmm. Where does the name Dragonfly actually come from? Yeah, we, um, well, we, we kicked around a, a, you know, a number of names. Um, um, I, I liked uh, initially proposed Highlander, you know, sort of hybrid lander, but yeah, it's kind of lame. Um, I think uh, Firefly came up at, at one point, and you know the idea of the um, radioisotope power source kind of glowing at the back. Um, but but Dragonfly was um, just a, um, a kind of really aesthetically um, appealing um, name. And, and dragonflies, you know, the creatures are really cool. You know, if you look at, at what they do at how they hunt, um, you know, they are, um, you know, really remarkable organisms. Um, there was the idea actually at one point that we might have um, uh, rotors that were not equal in size, that you'd have an upper plane of big rotors and you'd spin those at a sort of constant speed to um, provide a sort of sustaining level of lift. And then the, the lower set might be smaller in diameter, uh, which would make them more responsive. You know, they could spin up and spin down more quickly to sort of fine tune um, for, for maneuvering. And um, dragonfly wings are actually like that. They, they have slightly different um, uh, diameters as, as you know, reflected in the, 
in the in the logo. Um, but but Dragonfly, everyone just sort of thought, yeah, yeah, that's that's the the, the one to go for. Yeah, I think it really matches. It it kind of looks like a dragonfly too. <laughs> yeah, there's sort of a, a bit of a um, hexagonal motif in here that is um, uh, was supposed to sort of reference, um, you know, the the structure of DNA. Um, that works. Well, that, I mean, we had a lot of good feedback. A lot of people want to. Can't wait to. We had some people who really like the talk. Others want to show their the, the YouTube video to their high school students, show them how awesome. all the cool things engineers do and all the cool things you do just individually. It's amazing. Well, YouTube, Mike, um, it's, a, it's a great adventure um, technologically um, as well as scientifically. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a, a, most of the adventure is yet to come. Can't wait till 2027, right? <laughs> Me too. 2034 or whenever, yeah. Yeah, that'll be the big one. All right, I think my audio is back on now. That's good. Um, I do have one last question for you. Um, yeah. Unless anybody else has any more. So as a mission architect, what is your responsibility with the mission? Uh, Very good question. Um, uh, in fact, I, I started out um, uh, as uh, designated as the, the project scientist. Um, but um, uh, really what I do is... Um, uh, my, my main activity beyond the, the leading the dragmet instrument is defining the environments um, that the engineers uh, need to design to right um, you know the this um, turbulent spectrum for example sorry I'm gonna flick back here yeah um, you know is, is this the right description of a changing wind field for the um, mobility system engineers to design the autopilot to, to handle um, you know, how big should the skids be? Um, you know, how soft is the ground going to be in the, the sort of worst case soft place? How big are the rocks um, that we uh, might land near um, such that, you know, the one skid might be perched on a rock and, you know, does the focus of the camera have to extend beyond that? Um, so, um, you know, I, I, I get to kind of poke into uh, all the different aspects of the way the the vehicle will work, and and you know try to think of ways things could go wrong, so we can we can fix them um, uh, in, um, in in design before we before we cut metal. Um, so it's um, yeah, it's it's sort of straddling the the realms of of science and engineering. Um, I, I confess it is actually a role we sort of basically made with me in mind. Um, in um, the uh, the the idea for for Dragonfly, um, as, as proposed to this this the, the NASA uh, New Frontiers competition, um, arose between myself and um, uh, Jason Barnes, uh, who is the the guy between behind um, uh, this uh, uh, airplane idea actually, um, but obviously it draws on the um, the, the helicopter uh, ideas I'd, I'd had um, you know 20, 20 years ago. Um, so, you know, I, I, I played a, a, a central role from the, the very beginning, um, you know, many of the design decisions like, you know, do we have um, one drill or two drills? Uh, do we have the drills mounted on the skids rather than on an arm? Um, you know, a, a lot of these decisions we made, even, even the, the whole question of is four rotors or eight rotors the right number? I mean, obviously we, we draw on um, technical experts like uh, like people like Mike and colleagues from from Penn State, um, but I, I've been a, um, a player in in, in all these um, sort of major um, architectural decisions. Um, so so yeah, it's it's kind of uh, the, the 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 dream job for me. Um, you know, it's a perfect fit for the. Um, skill set and experience that I that I bring, and I, th I think I think I bring uh, good added value to the project that this way. Great, thank you. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you so much for the 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 seminar, Ralph. This is really informative, really great. We had a lot of good feedback here, and can't wait again to, to see how things turn out yeah um, uh, thank you very much for the uh, the invitation uh, and um, let me um, figure out how to
to drive again. Uh, let me just put this slide back up for people's benefit. Um, thank you for attending. Yeah, thank you very much, Ralph. Um, for anybody that's interested in learning more, definitely check out their website and all the awesome stuff coming up with that mission. I know I'm definitely looking forward to it. We got, what, six years to launch, so that'll be in our neck of the woods. So hopefully we'll all get to go outside and see a cool launch. And then there's another seven years wait, but, <laughs> you know, in the mid 2030s is going to be probably the coolest space mission I think that's been launched so far. Like, Osiris Rex is pretty neat bringing back a piece of an asteroid, but at the time that we can fly something on another planet is really a next step, I think. And, exploration because that's kind of what we all dreamed about right we're going to be flying around on mars and stuff not just taking these little rovers at two miles an hour well um don't forget that um uh, the perseverance rover has a small helicopter on it um, that is true. um it's uh, obviously um less ambitious uh than than dragonfly um mars is a very hard place to to do atmospheric flight um but we'll certainly be be watching uh, it, its efforts uh, with um, with great interest. Great. All right, Rob. No, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Please. I was just going to say, yeah, thank you. I think um, we don't have any further questions right now. So. All right. Uh, should I disconnect, or do we need to tie anything up after? No, I think we're good to go. Thank you okay. again for coming in. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. All right. Have Thanks, a good everyone. evening, everybody. All right. Thanks again, Ralph.